This is a negotiation in family law. Um, this covers pretty much the the basic pillars of negotiation. Um, I've been um, in practice for um, just over a decade now. Um, I've not long set up my own uh, law firm, Serenity Family Law. Um, big part of what I've done throughout my whole career um, is negotiation and it's still a learning experience, um, but in the last maybe four or five years, um, I've very much taken on um, studying negotiation um, from the perspective of things like business, uh, sorry, uh, Harvard Business and Law School, um, reading a lot of their stuff, uh, doing courses, things like that. Um, and what I've learned from that, a flavor of which I'm going to give you today, um, has massively turned around, um, I think, not just my ability to, to negotiate, um, but to generally help my clients out uh, and make them aware of what's going on. Um, I hope you enjoy this presentation. Um, it, it's to help you understand how negotiation generally should work, and it can help you help, you, um, help others understand what's going on in a larger scale. Um, now, before we sort of move on um, at all, I want to tell you a story, and it's based on a real file. It's an old file, but I still won't go into the names, okay? Um, and what I'd like you to do is keep in mind this case as we go through, okay? The story involves a, a married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Z, um, and they've been separated for a couple of years. Um, I represent Mrs. Z. They have one child who's about eight years old. There's a history of coercive and controlling behaviour on the part of Mr. Z against Mrs. Z. The child is unaware of the abuse and the child adores Mr. Z. He has a great deal of influence over her and he uses this as leverage all the time. Mr. Z has also been very secretive with money and does not want to pay out um, anything more than he thinks he can get away with. Matters are complicated by his work, which is seasonal and can often be last minute. Mrs. Z feels that he uses this to perpetuate the control over her, but she's afraid to say anything to him and is concerned that bringing up financial matters will cause him to leverage the child who currently lives with her. Negotiations have been with other solicitors and family mediation, and now it lands on my desk. So, what are we going to go through today? Well, the first thing we'll, we'll talk about just broadly and very briefly is why do negotiations go wrong? Um, and thus, why do, um, do dads, mums, everybody who's involved get so frustrated? Then we'll look at what's called selection and maintenance of aim. break up a little bit. Kathy. Kathy, I can't hear you. Can you just confirm that my internet's okay because I'm getting a sort of warning sign up here? Yeah, no, you're breaking up slightly. I'm just wondering whether if you just switch off your video of yourself, it should make it more stable. Yeah. And see if you're looking at my face. Right, okay, there you go. <laughs> I'll message okay. you if you've got any more problems, Michael. Uh, right. uh, is that a bit better, Cathy? Yeah, seems fine. Excellent. Okay, I'll continue. So then we're going to look into what's called game theory. Okay, and this gives a sort of overarching principle. Um, and when you're helping dads get perspective, this is probably one of your main tools. Okay, um, I use this a lot with clients, it's good for the morale. It's good uh, to give them an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing. Finally, some brief hints and tips about how you can help your own neg negotiations. We'll then conclude and um, I'll, I'm happy to take some questions. So, why do negotiations go so wrong? Well, the main one is a lack of communication. This can be bilateral or multilateral. Either side not talking to each other or even parties on one side not talking to each other for example, the client and the solicitor. This causes the key component of negotiation, 
communication to either break down or not be as effective as it could be. We'll come to lack of aim in a moment, but the main effect of a lack of aim is a lack of understanding about what the negotiation is actually about. Likewise, this leads to a change in aim or objective. The target keeps moving, which does not allow for strategy or tactical development. By the time a strategy is in place, a new strategy has to be worked out. This is because all strategy is led by aim or objective. Likewise, small wins without the overall strategy means that nothing is developing. If it does, then it's pure happenstance. Tactics are a way of achieving strategic aims. They're not a, a, an end in themselves. Failing to engage with what are, as I will explain, the fundamentals of negotiation. This failure to engage can be by the client, either because they do not wish to or because the lawyer does not involve them in the decision making, or the lawyer themselves because they do not have a developed understanding of modern strategy. Uh, the best example of this is hardballing. Um, it's a style you may see from many solicitors. Your guy is going to lose, so you had better capitulate or you'll be emba uh, embarrassed in court. That sort of harks back to the art of the deal rather than modern negotiation theory developed by Harvard and other experts. Um, frankly, um, I can't stand it. Um, and it's, it's not productive for anybody. So, selection and maintenance of aim. Um, for anybody here who's got a military background, you'll immediately recognize that phrase. Um, but to understand it, if, if you've never come across it before, let's consider, and I know this sounds a little bit right field, but the war in Afghanistan. Um, a lot of these um, theories were developed from um, Cold War and post-Cold War uh, negotiations, but they're applicable um, uh, across the field. So if you think about Afghanistan, um, what was its purpose? Think what the purpose started off with and what it ended up with. That's what's called mission creep. Now, the problem with that from a family law um, and child law in particular, and negotiation context, is that a fully formed strategy never takes form. Since the aim or objective was never decided from the outset, there is no ability to have a strategic overview of the negotiation. This applies the same in litigation. We'll consider this later in uh, when we discuss game theory as well. What is it we're trying to do? What can we do? What can be agreed upon? What can't? From a contact perspective, Sorry, excuse me, I'm just taking a drink of water. Sorry. From a contact perspective, the objective is often to get contact. What does that even mean? A better example, and what um, I would come up with when working with my clients, is something like this. To get contact at a minimum of every second weekend and one weekday on an overnight and unsupervised basis in order to maintain a close and involved relationship with my child. Said contact should be con sustainable in the long term. That statement does a couple of things. It states the long term aim, but also states a parameter to that. There's no point getting all the contact you want if the other side will simply not play ball. Once in court, you obviously have the ability to compel contact orders, but contempt hearings do not, uh, sorry, do the opposite of building relationships between parties. So this not only indicates what's to be achieved, but how. And that helps you frame negotiations, something we'll come to in a moment. So how do we get that statement? And this is something you can work with your, um, your, your dads on um, if they're, they're struggling to figure out what it is they want to do. How do we select our aim or objective? Well, we can utilize SMART objectives. Uh, SMART uh, an acronym, stands for, so one second. Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Now, I'll not go too much uh, further into that because it's it's a pretty straightforward tool. Um, you can Google it and you can find out all about it um, on there. It's a pretty standard tool for creating an objective, but it's a very useful one as well. So now we have our statement of aim. The key is now to keep it, unless there's a good reason to depart from it. Remember, this is not about having to change tack, avoid being flexible or anything like that, but rather to have a consistent reason for doing things. 
It means that all decisions are made with this in mind. Do not abandon it lightly. But all the same, be prepared to change and advise your guys to be prepared to change in light of new facts. It should not change fundamentally, though. The statement of aim should always employ what's called action-orientated language. If we refer back to that objective, objective statement, statement that I used earlier, there was a specific term, in order to. What that does is it leads to a justification of why you're doing this. It forces the client, the solicitor, everybody to justify why they are doing the things that they are doing. Honesty at the beginning and with the representative is key. If it is, quote unquote, in order to get back at the X, then this will come out in the fullness of time and it won't work. It's best to be honest right from the off. Something along the lines of, in order to have a closer relationship with my child is a better option. Also, never use the legal test in order to meet the best interests of the child. It, fr it means nothing, frankly, from a negotiation perspective, because at the end of the day, the interest of the child is subjective, particularly from a negotiation standpoint. When you get into litigation, that becomes a different matter. But it's so subjective that it means nothing, frankly. Finally, when you're stuck in a rut, refer back to it. It acts as a strategic tactical and tactical guide, but it's also a morale booster when things seem far off. So we're going to come to the first of the pillars of negotiation, framing. So, so you, you guys offered what he thinks is a great deal, but the counterpart doesn't seem to agree. I don't know why that's speeding up. So what's the problem? The offer may be excellent, but it's how you've approached the framing negotiation that's holding things back. The concept of framing in negotiation describes the fact that the way that we describe our offers strongly affects how others view them. For example, research by Max Bazerman, Margaret Neal, and Tom Magliozzi found that people tend to resist compromises and then to declare an impasse when those compromises are framed as losses rather than gains. You'll also hear the term optics. Essentially, it's the same thing. It's how you present an offer and knowing how the other side will see it and react to it. The key to that is empathy, which we will deal with later on. However, framing's for, framing is for everyone involved. Solicitors frame to their clients and frame to each other. Uh, you can often tell who a letter is really directed at when you look at its language. Some hints about framing that you can be involved in if you're a party to negotiation in any, any way, rather than being the negotiator themselves, is always make it easy for the other side to back down. Don't come barreling in simply because it's justified. Achieving the aim of the objective is more important and good framing that lets the other side keep face is a key principle. Always control the framing. It's in all the correspondence, it's in all the multilateral meetings, and don't simply say things for the sake of them. In many cases, and I know this is hard for most lawyers to understand, less is more. Look, looking for early on low cost opportunities means using opening gambits to create trusting relationships between all parties. Framing something as I'm coming after you is a lot more difficult for good faith negotiations than I hope we can find an opportunity to work together to find a solution that benefits everybody. That last part is called creating value. Um, it's something I won't go into because it's an entire lecture on its own. Finally, always have a justification for an offer. There has to be a rationale. However, don't be tepid about it. Be clear that this is the offer and why. I'll leave it at that. However, keep in mind that offers beyond opening gambits are part of a process that builds up to them. Creating trust through framing helps them be accepted more readily. Put another way, it's like climbing a hill, climbing a mountain. Only once you've reached the peak does that offer go in. All the way through, you're building rapport, you're building that relationship, and you're building the, the structures 
um, at which point when you get to the top, in goes and it goes. Offers should not just be thrown out from the hip, as it were. So let's look at the case of Mr. and Mrs. Z that we went on about earlier on. For me, uh, when I was dealing with this case, it was clear that the, the problems with contact are his, and I say this with inverted commas, his fault. Partly it's something he can't, he, he can't do anything about. He has to work and his work is seasonal. But there are other elements such as surprise changes and the demands on my client that he can deal with. However, he's also incredibly defensive. When under attack, he comes out swinging. And remember that he has a relationship with his daughter, which he uses as ultimate leverage. So framing in this instance was really important. I looked back at some of the letters and these are some of the terms we used. We understand that his work commitments make it difficult to organize contact. We know that both parties will need to find a long-term and sustainable solution. We have our solution, but we would be grateful for any input he could give. We're essentially making him think that he's in control and it's not about control, but we are controlling the framing of it. Process. This is something people completely forget about. And all three of these pillars are equally important um, within a process. Again, I'll start with the example of Mr. and Mrs. Z. You'll recall that he's somewhat miserly with money, but we also have a child contact and residence issue where he has leverage over us. So we had a process strategy. We would not enter into any meaningful uh, negotiations or substantive discussion about finances until after the child contact issue had been agreed and entered into a, a contact minute of agreement. In the meantime, we will continue to ingather the financial information. Once all that is in and the agreement for contact is in place, then we will have more leverage to enter into financial discussions freely. This was very important because it was clear that he'd been incredibly evasive when they did initially split up and we were probably going to have to take him to the cleaners so far as he was concerned. So the first letters going out were all about the process. No substantive discussions whatsoever. The temptation is to start with an offer. Not until you've agreed the process and the implementation of any agreement, in this case, the sequencing and need for a minute of agreement and contact. Only once we had an explicit, unambiguous, public, i.e. it's in letter form, and personal, it is the client's commitment, not his or her solicitors, did we move on to the substantive negotiations. Even if somebody walks away, stay at the table. Family law, as we all know, is emotional. Participants, including some solicitors, are prone to overreact. Don't mirror that. En encourage your guys to stay at the table. Be ready to pick up where they left off and give space, opportunity and incentive to return to the table. Nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. That seems like a simple idea, but if you think back again to the case of Mr. and Mrs. Z, it appears that we are agreeing contact and then moving on to agree the finances. No, these are two separate but linked negotiations, or at least that's how I structured the process. Nothing in the contact case was agreed until everything was agreed. Likewise, in the financial negotiation. Why? Well, if you start a small part of something, then you de-incentivize the need to deal with other matters. Remember, they may have a name that is different from yours. You give them what they need to achieve that uh, to, to achieve their aim early on, then why are they going to stick around for your sake? Slight health warning in this. Although I say nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, there is within family law, there's one major exemption. Interim agreements to say get contact up and running don't count here. They are part of a process. But nothing is fully agreed, i.e. written down until everything is agreed. And finally, be committed to the process and demonstrate this. Basically, lead by example and stick to the process that you've started. Now, I said all three pillars are equally important. 
Um, I'll, I'll redact that statement. Nothing is more important in negotiation than empathy. I'll repeat that. Nothing is more important in negotiation. A question for you all. Um, and feel free to, to, to throw some answers up and I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that. Um, and no Googling it. Um, <laughs> what was the nuclear kite crisis around Cuba in 1962 known as to the Russians? All right, guys, so we all know it as the Cuban Missile Crisis. However, to the Russians, it was called either the Caribbean Crisis or as the October Crisis of 1962. And why was that? Well, it's because their perspective and immediate history were different from that of the US. The US was focused on where the Russian missiles were. Russia was both focused on a more regional issue, and it was also not the only crisis they had around that time. They had plenty. They were potentially in the middle of a coup. Knowing that perspective, if you go and read about the Cuban Missile Crisis, lets you know why the negotiations panned out the way they did. Empathy is not sympathy. And without it, you cannot frame negotiations. You cannot decide what process works best for you. And it is not a weakness. Used properly, it can increase your options. To do it effectively, you have to be open to all explanations for behavior. Now that can be very difficult. And when you're working with guys, this is something that I would massively encourage, is make them switch their thinking to consider all options that, that might explain behavior. Unlike most negotiations in law, business, um, geopolitics or war, family law lends itself well to one aspect of empathy. The parties actually know each other. However, one of the problems is having to discard your own bias. Either you guys can help with that or the solicitors have to challenge them on it. Why? Because while you, while knowing the person well, you also have the high emotions that contain what you think. And again, that is why it's such an important factor. If you get on well with the person on the other side, there's a good chance that you don't really need to employ the darker arts of uh, negotiation, do you? However, if they are a nightmare to deal with, then it's all the more important that you empathise, not sympathise, with their point of view. Essentially, it's needed most for those who deserve it least. This can be difficult, even when it comes to things like, you know, yielding to create leverage. For example, letting them think they've won. If they're trying to win, and in doing so, your objective is not undermined, then let them win. Let them go on about it. You know, your, you know their aim is to win, and yours is to achieve your objective in relation to the kids. Or at least that's what you're telling your guys. Let the other side have it. Let them have their wins. It matters not. But I'll come to game theory later on and why people sometimes struggle to make uh, that connection. In order to do all this, though, you need to get into their thinking. Um, often clients, uh, my clients are taken aback by the conclusions they come to uh, in a, pro uh, a process I use called ICAPS. Uh, now, I can't share that with you in detail because it's commercially sensitive, but the basics of it um, are basically how you analyze the other side. And the basic questions you can ask is, what do the other side prioritize? Where do they have flexibility? Where are their red lines? And what is their... It's also important to keep in mind if there are third parties that you can use um, within the negotiation. Now, that can be anything from the solicitor on the other side to create framing, to even a family member that's still friends with you um, or friends with your, uh, your punter um, that can get the inside track and create some influence from another angle. Um, but that has to be done with a great deal of care um, and should only be done with the oversight of somebody who's very skilled 
um, at negotiation and understands how these things are done. Now some health warnings, and these are good ones to pass on. Ignore ultimatums. This is actually a good life lesson, this one. Ignore ultimatums. It shows that their options are actually weak. It is better yet to rephrase them. For example, they say, if you don't settle, we'll see you in court. Ignore that and respond with something along the lines of, well, that's very good. Um, we believe that there are still options on the table and we can save our clients money by settling this now. All of a sudden, the solicitor on the other side is going to have to explain why it will cost more to see through the ultimatum expenses. Um, his client will not be happy. Now, before I come back to the last point, I want to bring back Mr. and Mrs. Z. We sat down and we did our ICAPS review at the beginning of negotiations because I felt that it was warranted. We then knew exactly what our strategy was, how to frame things to limit his over the top reactions and the best process to use to achieve our goals. It also gave my client a morale boost and the confidence to take on a former abuser while simultaneously not baiting him. So she wasn't right, she wasn't going to his level, as it were. Finally, and it was always going to come up, a lesson from Brexit. Um, so bear with me. The reason it was a torturous process goes back to something that Theresa May did. She was very much focused internally. She was thinking about who to placate within her party. So she approached negotiations from that standpoint. And understandably, um, these went nowhere when she tried to challenge the pillars of the EU. Those pillars are what made the EU the EU. With all the goodwill in the world, there was nothing that they could do to, to come across the table on that one. So the process was awful for her politically, and frankly, the negotiations never recovered. Um, anybody who studies negotiations um, will, and was studying it th throughout, was aghast at some of the approaches that were being taken. So the lesson from that is beware of red lines and know what the other side's red lines are. And this brings us to game theory. Now, again, I'm going to come back to Afghanistan um, again, just because it's a very, very good example of how it works. So we go back to Afghanistan and the coalition were trying to win a war against an enemy that lived there, had essentially infinite will and needed little in the way of the resources because they lived there. It was their homeland. On the flip side, the coalition had to ship in its resources at great expense with political and public will to stay there increasingly limited and diminishing. So we moved from trying to win to then stabilization and other uh, things that we were trying to do to then simply removing troops. The Taliban didn't win per se, but they achieved their objectives in the same way as the Mujahideen did against the USSR. Essentially what's happened is they were playing the right game and the coalition was playing the wrong game. So what game were the, the coalition playing? They were playing a finite game. So what's a finite game? Finite games have winners and losers. The rules of the game are known to both sides. The boundaries of the playing field are well defined. The scoreboard keeps track of the game's activity. And at the end of a prescribed period of time, a winner is declared. It's neat, it's clean, someone wins and someone loses. When the test for contact cases is though that the paramount consideration is the welfare of the child, how does that square with a finite game? When, when you're a parent, when is there a prescribed period and test when you are declared, quote unquote, the winner? The easy assumption when you're involved in a binary negotiation or litigation is that success equals somebody winning at the expense of somebody losing. Now keep in mind that if you win, somebody's got to lose and losers are never happy people. Now let's look at the infinite game. Infinite games have no winners or losers. Rules don't often exist, and if they do, they are fuzzy and open to interpretation. It sounds like parenting to me. The playing field is undefined, and progress is hard to measure. When do we know we're being good parents? Opponents change frequently, as does the game itself. Now, I would read into that, that section, that part of the definition, as the people involved in everybody's lives will change. Parents who are separated will get new partners. The children will get older. Their lives will change with their friends and things like that. Um, and that in itself changes the game. 
things are always in flux. There are no clear winners or losers in the infinite game. Competitors drop out of the infinite game when they lose the will or the resources to, uh, to keep playing. The goal is to outlast your competition. Now, that's a traditional um, way of looking at it. The way I would look at that within a family law context is the goal is to stay within that game until the kid is 16. I'm probably beyond, to be honest, because we're still talking about off to university, college, work, them getting married themselves, their kids and things like that. So when does this end? When, when is the day that you go, oh, that's it, I've won at parenting? Um, be great if you could. Um, I'm sure I'd be a much better parent if you could do it that way. Um, the, so the goal is not perhaps to outlast your competition, but it's, it certainly is to stay in the game. That sounds like family law. That sounds like parenting. So why are parents who are seeking contact orders and those defending them playing the wrong game? What lessons can we take from that to ensure the welfare of the child is actually at the heart of it? Clearly, the finite game does little to promote that test. And in my view, it does little to promote what absent parents seeking contact are trying to achieve. Now, while there are finite games within infinite games, in the end, the, the parents, both of them, have to continue to be parents to the same children and somehow cooperate. Thinking about that adventure and eventuality is, in my view, the correct mindset. A financial provision case uh, in divorce where there are no kids is different. It's meant to be clean cut. There are known rules and there can be a winner and a loser. That's a finite game. However, Again, we're going to go back to the case of Mr. and Mrs. Z. There is a child contact and residence issue, and there's also finances. The goodwill in the contact case, once you've come to the agreement, can be soured by the way, the manner, in which you conduct the financial negotiation. Now, that doesn't mean that you capitulate. You know, certainly you have your parental rights and responsibilities, and you have what you're entitled to um, under the Family Law Scotland Act 1985. But once you've got your money, you've got to go back to being a parent. You've got to go back to working together. And you've also got to go back to being able to make the, the, the minute of agreement that you've got in respect to the child actually work in the real world. So it doesn't mean that you capitulate, but you give this other side every opportunity to save face. So how can you help with your negotiation or how can you advise people to um, help with their own negotiations? So be aware of the game that you're playing. Be clear and consistent about what your aims are. There may be more than one. Um, the main effort will be the main goal that you're, you're trying to get. And don't forget that. Empathise. Be aware that there is a process. Help that process and don't fight it. Using your empathy... Think how you can best help your solicitor frame an offer. Think how you can help other people, um, help dads frame their offer to the other side using empathy. And finally, and this is probably the good advice for you guys to pass on, understand that negotiations are difficult. I've been doing this for 10 years and I'm still learning all the time. I'm still getting better. I'm still improving and I'll probably never be there. But you can make it easier. And the key to that is being patient. So what, have we, what should you be taking away from this? That there's a game to be played, understand that game. Having an objective and keeping it. Empathising with the other side is absolutely key. Frame everything continually. Consider the best process and commit to it and have patience and focus on the big picture. <laughs>